It's time for Talking Pints. Now, Dr Gavin Ashenden was on our list of people to have for Talking Pints. Unfortunately, this is a down-the-line conversation because our other guest for today for Talking Pints was rushed to A&E, and we hope he's OK. Gavin, I'm sorry it wasn't in the studio, but cheers, and thank you for joining us. <laughs> Nigel, not at all. It's nice to be a part of the conversation on any terms at all. Good health to you and to everyone listening. Now, I understand you're drinking a bishop's finger, is that right? Well, I asked my wife what she thought I should drink, and she said bishop's finger is the only <laughs> thing you could really take off to GP well, News. So, so any lack of taste is, is laid at her doorstep, not mine. <laughs> no, I think in, in terms of a, a man of the cloth, I think it's a very, very appropriate choice indeed. Now, Gavin, I, I guess, in a sense, um, your early life and education was steeped in the history of Christianity in this country because, of course, you were at school in Canterbury, where St Augustine started it all. I, I was. I, um, although, to tell you the truth, I didn't much like clergy and I didn't much like the church. I thought they were unimpressive, really. Um, and so uh, I was at school at Canterbury, but I was very affected by the cathedral. I, I, I just found it sort of uh, awesome in the American sense. God, it, just to, to live in around that building meant you, made you ask questions. Uh, all the time. And I decided the way I deal with this is I'd live one year as an atheist and the other year as a Christian through through my school career. And I mean, I remember the great thing about being an atheist was I didn't have to share my bootleg liquor with anybody because atheists <laughs> don't have to share. And, and, and when, I, when I was a Christian, I felt obliged to, to open my bottom drawer and share my bootleg liquor. Uh, so that was morally and ethically quite hard. But I left school on, uh, for an atheist patch and uh, so I was still open-minded, really, about the whole business of God and religion. Yeah, I mean, Canterbury Cathedral, absolutely magnificent. And, you know, you can go and see the Thomas Beckett Shrine and all the rest of it. And now, of course, for people to go and visit the HQ of the Church of England, they're charged some extraordinary sum of money on the door. Is that right to make Canterbury Cathedral no. so inaccessible? No, it's absolutely terrible. The, the, the cathedrals are, I mean, they're a gift, of course. They're, they're, they're part of our heritage. They're very expensive to keep up. Um, and I must say, although it's complicated, I rather like the French system, whereby the states say, uh, I mean, their motivation wasn't very pure, but the outcome is good. The states say these are far too important to leave to, to, the, to widows and minorities. We'll, we'll keep them up. But it's quite wrong because the, ultimately... Uh, church buildings are not cultural artifacts. They're places where people encounter God or try to encounter God. Yeah. And you can't, you can't simply say, well, you can come in if you've got 5, 10, 15 or 20 quid, but otherwise, you know, you, it's not for you. There, had, there, there should be, there needs to be another way. Um, it's not, it, how you get there from here, I don't know, but um, it's, it sends up the wrong signals and it's entirely the wrong way of doing it. No, I agree. I agree. I think it's all wrong. Now, after your atheist phase, you decided actually this was your future and you, you were ordained, I noticed, by Mervyn Stockwood, who was, of course... <laughs> yes. who, who, of course, who, by the way, and, and, and you, you don't know this, but I was actually confirmed by Mervyn Stockwood. Uh, and, of course, he was a, a really radical left-wing bishop, wasn't he? He was. He was extraordinary. Um, I, I mean, I, I went to, to, to Bristol to do law. My father was a lawyer. My uncles were lawyers. And, um, uh, and I wanted to be a lawyer. And I, I, I got rather fed up uh, when I had this pressing sense that I needed to be a clergyman. Because as I say, I, I, you know, I, I spent the whole of my life reading Henry Cecil books about, about, <laughs> about barristers taking risks for, for justice. Um, but I had this, I had this profound sense I had to become a clergyman. And I also thought that, actually, you know, along with Shakespeare's "Kill All the Lawyers," lawyers also don't have the best of reputations. But I knew there was a lot wrong with society, and one of the things I, uh, I, I, I came to not realise, but 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 one of these emerging perceptions inside me was that if you wanted to change society, you needed to change people one by one. You, there had to be a transformation of the heart. And one of the things that Christianity commended itself to me over particularly was that it had produced the most radical transformation program through history. And whether you talk about St. Francis of Assisi or William Wilberforce or Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, or Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who became a huge hero for me, um, that's where the really impressive people were. And so one of the ways I, I consoled myself about being an Anglican clergyman was that if you got it right, you could really do an enormous amount of good to the way in which people lived their lives. 
Well, you certainly worked your way up through the church pretty effectively, you know, from Paris priest to the synod. And then how on earth do you become appointed as chaplain to the Queen? How does that happen? <laughs> well, do you want to know the truth? <laughs> Please. Well, the, the truth was that... that uh, I kept on being bumped off the preferment list. A number of dioceses asked me, uh, wanted my name at least on in, in the pool, uh, because I used to go around as a diocesan missioner and cheer people up, and, uh, and, and, and enough people liked me to say, well, we might fancy him as our bishop. But I had made some enemies in the church. I'm not entirely sure why, but I think, I think the culture wars that we're already fully engaged in were beginning then. And I think the people who ran the Church of England uh, thought that I might not be on their side. And so one day, poor Rowan Williams phoned up the Queen personally, I'm told, and said, we've got to give Gavin something. Can, can we give him a consolation prize? Can we, can we put him on, you know, make him a member of the Royal Ecclesiastical Household? Now, his secretary told me that, so I think it's true. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's how I ended up as part of the Royal Ecclesiastical Household. So certainly I had, I had bishops say to me, we, want, we also want to do as our cathedral dean, but the establishment <laughs> told us we couldn't have you. So, so uh, I mean, that's, for me, I was saved from a great deal of responsibility uh, and, and endlessly trying to raise money. But um, that's how it happened. And it must have been just the most extraordinary privilege. I mean, not just because she's the Queen, but because she is a woman of profound faith, isn't she? It was a huge privilege, and not only because of who she is, but actually the Royal Ecclesiastical, Ecclesiastical Household, uh, as, a, as a sort of department of the monarchy, is extremely interesting. It goes back to the Battle of Agincourt. What, what we know about it is, uh, we, we, we first, what we know about Agincourt was written by a blogging royal chaplain who sat on the baggage train before it was captured by the French and, and, and wrote up the battle. But um, there's been this, this body. I mean, the, one of the things that doesn't really get told is there are 36 royal chaplains at any one time. The problem is that I've been the most garrulous the others, the, others have been, the others have been quiet and dignified and well-behaved. Uh, and I've, I think I've, I mean, it became clear to me after a while that I was bending the terms of the implicit terms. They weren't ever made explicit. I was bending the implicit terms by becoming, by speaking out in the public place about things that mattered. And in the end, it became clear, per perfectly rightly, that it, I, I couldn't, I couldn't associate the Queen with the cultural and spiritual views that I had personally, and that I would either have to be quiet or resign. I mean, it was put to me in the most delicate and beautiful of ways, but that was what it came to. And, and at the time, I thought the direction that our society was taking was, was so critical um, that I absolutely wouldn't be quiet. Apart from anything else, one of the things that cancel culture has been doing for quite a while is trying to shut Christians up take away the voice of the church, to, si to silence the Gospels. I mean, the, the, the Gospels are now subversive literature. You can't have them in most places. And so I saw that coming and decided that my, my duty to Christ, my duty to his church meant that I absolutely couldn't speak up. And if it meant, you know, if that meant stopping going to garden parties and preaching at St. James's Palace, well, that was a price I was very willing to pay. Well, I mean, one thing, Gavin, that we just, I mean, absolutely could never accuse you of um, is being quiet. Uh, because, you know, you're on, <laughs> you're on Fox News in America and you're on Sky News Australia and you're here with us on GB News and goodness knows uh, wherever else you appear. But all those years, all those years that you were in the Church of England, the established church in this country, but in the end you felt you simply couldn't continue and uh, you've gone off and joined the Catholic Church. That must have been a very big moment. And I want to ask you what... What precipitated it? Was it one big thing? Was it a series of things? No, it was a series of things. I mean, the fact was, the Church of England was my home. Uh, mm. You know, from the, my, my father was a was an atheist as a teenager, and uh, he was orphaned. His father got got killed in the nineteen thirties, um, and there was an insurance policy that his employers had, and so he was sent to a Baptist public school, uh, and became a Christian when he was there. And then he became an Anglican. And, and I, I, I sung in a, in a church choir in South London. I went to Canterbury. I was ordained in the church. It was my life, culturally speaking. But, what, but they changed it under our feet. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and as society changed, the Church of England, as a state church, had this very difficult decision to make. When society goes off in a way that's different to Christianity, 
a state church has to either go with it and abandon its own integrity, or it has to call society back. And it became crystal clear to me <laughs> that since the forces that were moving society were taking us in a, uh, it, well, essentially in a totalitarian direction, taking away our freedom of speech, taking away our freedom of thought. Uh, I spent 25 years at a very progressive university. So I got a kind of advance whiff of it, really, and I saw what was coming and realized what was at stake. And so as the Church of England began to give in to yeah. this, to essentially to political correctness, uh, I spoke out against it, I agitated against it, I argued against it. Um, but but in the end, when they began to change the nature of the faith to make it conform to what we might call political correctness, uh, that was the point where I said, "Well, not not in my name. You don't. I don't. I can't go that oh, way." Well, and you know, the point came when I'd stop. You're not uh, alone in that, and indeed, a previous guest on Talking Pints, Bishop Michael Nazarali, former Bishop of Rochester, um, and he's made that same journey that you've made, um, but without getting too involved in you know the established church, the Catholic Church history. More broadly, in terms of society, in terms of the Christian underpinning, in terms of principles of pretty much everything that we've ever stood for, uh, and given that we now have a quite rapidly growing number of people of Muslim faith uh, living within the United Kingdom, as you look ahead, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, whatever it may be, can those two faiths come to a happy accommodation? So I think one of the ways of describing this is almost as if you had a wrestling ring. And, and, and in the wrestling ring, you have three historic figures. And they're Jesus, Mohammed, and Marx. Uh, and you might say that the, 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 the Marx, the Mar, you know, Marx is on the far left and the Islam is on the far right. I mean, that already becomes controversial. Uh, and, 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 and Jesus is non-politically aligned, as he was always non-politically aligned. But the fact is, that these are the three major influences on our culture. And what people don't understand or they won't admit to is they're not compatible with each other. And one of the ways I discovered that was I, I used to smuggle Bibles into the Soviet Union in the 1980s. I got caught by the KGB. I got interrogated by them. They were quite rough. They threatened to send me to prison camp for 20 years and give me one year off for every family I betrayed. Uh, I had no illusions about what Marxism did. Uh, it, it, the, the death toll amongst Christians and, and ordinary Russians was, was between 40 and 60 million. In, in Marxism in China killed over 90 million. So I knew what the, what the problem with the left was. If you're hist I taught Islam at the university I was at. I was and one of the reasons that I found myself invited onto news programs was that I, I gave factual answers to factual questions. My poor daughter, used to get up at about six o'clock and say, oh, daddy, you're in the Daily Mail again. Would you please stop it? What you, and I would say, well, they ask me questions and they're questions of fact. And, you know, when I answer with fact, they, I, I, you know, because other people won't tell the fact. So, the, you know, the, unfortunately, Islam and Christianity are both, they both have very serious designs on everybody's soul. Uh, and they're both completely uncompromising. They're uncompromising in different ways, but they're not compatible it, they're compatible in the sense that we can live side by side right but um i mean you don't you don't need me to re rehearse the history of it so no no, no, no. I, I mean gavin gavin, gavin, gavin gavin as long as we can live peacefully side by side and coexist that seems to me to be the, to be the most important thing looking ahead well okay you'll forgive me for saying that i think christians are good at that I mean, Christians annoy people by saying, would you like to be reconciled with God? And would you like to know Jesus better? It's a wonderful question, because when people are doing counter Christ, their lives are transformed. Okay. And frankly, I'm, pa I'm passionate about that. Why wouldn't I be? I'm a Christian. And I understand entirely that my Muslim friends say, actually, we prefer Muhammad. And we have some really quite passionate arguments about, about the virtues of the two of mm. them. And there are some very important virtues in Islam. Islam has got some highly commendable bits to it. But as a Christian, uh, I find Christianity more compellingly well, attractive, as Gavin, I'm entitled to. So now we're, we're in a race to try and persuade our neighbours which of the two is more attractive. But there are implications. There are political and cultural implications. And if you want to know what they are, you check out what a Muslim country looks like, where they've had practiced Islam for 500 years, and check out what a Christian country looks like. And you'll see they involve two well, entirely that, different sets of values. 
Gavin, on that very profound point, can I just thank you very much for stepping in at the last minute? I'd much rather have had you in the studio, and I'd much rather we had an hour or two to have this conversation, because we've barely begun it. But Gavin Ashenden, thank you very much indeed for joining me here on Talking Pints at GB News. Andrew, thank you for having me.